world experts in the BIM space, they share their grumbles and we all like to have a grumble, yeah? <laughs> we, we are definitely included. But some of the quotes that we've got on the screen that we'll go through have come from experts around the world that have been trying to implement better BIM planning. And the one here says, we find most BIM standards overly complex and difficult for our teams to implement. So it's understanding that there are many of these, and as we saw, lots of different ways of interpreting that across the world. So that's a big challenge for people. Some areas, there's too much detail, content is non-existent, can't practically use most standards on real projects. These types of comments were about having, I think, good standards, but not being able to understand which one to use, when to use it, how to use it. So there's a lot of challenges in the, the amount of complexity out there. Not that we haven't got great um, work and great standards and great, great information. Yeah, the guidelines are awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, standards seem to be too fixed. We have found it a real challenge to implement without the flexibility to fill in the gaps. This was an understanding of one number is a very difficult thing to track six or more different variables. Yeah, and this is what we've, we've seen when you unpack LOD. The LOD number, when you try to unpack this, within each of these categories, you have all these questions that you probably want to answer depending on a BIM use. So you can imagine the different variations, but we're limited right. to one number to, to generally define all of the combinations of these. And then about this LOD 500, mystical 500. Uh, it was required in this situation, wasted time, modeled too many elements, and in the end, they were not important for the owner. When we talk about LOD 500, because it's a scale, the challenge here is when I'm looking at it and thinking, well, 500 is more than 400. Right. So therefore, it's more accuracy and more, and more, more elements, work. more work, more information, more of all of these things. But geometry could be a lot lower. So the requirement of a handover model or an as-built model doesn't have to include all of the elements or all of the detailed geometry. It's usually that people want less. On the accuracy side of things, we cannot get as accurate as we can in the CAD and BIM. So therefore, we have to specify less, otherwise we won't achieve it. And then on the information side of things, usually we want to have slightly different information compared to what we needed to build it. We would like warranty information. We would like pieces of data that could help us operate and maintain that asset. So, so often people were telling us that they were trying to win projects. They were asked for a certain LOD 400 plus Kobe data or something along those lines. And it got them into trouble. Yes. It was a big risk on their project. So in this situation, there's a lot of education and trying to educate on really what 400 means or what Kobe means and you know, know that it's not even specifying certain information. It's which just standard? a, I mean, it's it's just a handover protocol. We're saying LOD 400, what, which standard do you start with? Uh, what's the right standard for your company or this project? Um, and what we see is architects, contractors, and owners just all coming to an agreement of, okay, LOD 400, and then just throwing it to, say, a BIM manager to kind of unpack what's needed, what are the uses, and then you have the design teams basically you know, asking them, what does this mean? Interesting comments about working with the existing standards that they are disconnected from the spreadsheets that people are using generally to complete a BIM plan. That disconnect was causing challenges here, the need for two monitors, um, one for the spec and one for the Excel sheet that they were using. But seeing that disconnect between the way that you're creating the scopes it was seen to be a challenge, time consuming, miscommunication potentially as well. We looked at those as six, but there are many others that are causing this confusion. Just isolating those six, we will go through those and talk about the solutions, but what is the result of the miscommunication? <laughs> <laughs> this type of thing then ends up happening when we do not get the deliverable or the output that we, are, we were looking for. And Louis is going to give us a brilliant <laughs> Zoolander quote. School for ants. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be at least three times the size of this. So if you <laughs> if you've seen the Zoolander movie, you will uh, understand. Otherwise, this is completely yeah, lost on you. Just ignore us. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when we have this mis miscommunication is a blame game. Right. Well, uh, I asked for four hundred. What What have you given me? This isn't four hundred. 
well, how do we define what 400 was beforehand? And how do we actually become clear on a valuable set of specified elements, data, geometry, etc.? So we said, what if? What if we were able to apply technology to remove all of those confusions and more and apply a much leaner workflow so that we could really dig in and understand how to specify in a much more visual and simple way that owners would understand, people would be able to get what they needed, et cetera, et cetera. The first challenge we, we looked at was, was there are many different standards. And to simplify that, inside of the platform, we have simply allowed users to choose whichever standard they use, whichever one they, they would like to follow. So if it's the AIA interpretation, or if it's the BIM forum interpretation of LOD, which are different, the, the AIA includes 100 through 500, the BIM forum includes 200 through 400, and also includes a 350. So there are variations that people would use um, in the UK, a, a slightly different scale, but we have mapped those together. We also offer the opportunity to add the LOA scale, level of accuracy scale as well. And each of these still have those features of flexibility, and Clyde will mention those in a, in a couple minutes. The other one was the complexity. So we said, let's make it simple. Yes. <laughs> um, there are uh, some, some fantastic and very detailed ways of doing this and we would always go towards the simple. The key here is creating a framework. We at LOD Planner are not trying to create a standard, a new way of doing things. We're trying to simplify what's there, support what's there, but create a framework that makes the solutions of all of what we've, we will share today a lot more accessible to people, yes. make it easier to understand which standards to drag from, which which information is important, but at a targeted level, and make it clean and clear, and we'll, we'll take you through a little, little bit more of that. But making it simple. This is one we will unpack. So one of the really key things here was to understand how to, with one number, define all of these different aspects. And what we'll just walk through is how we've gone using software to make the concept of LOD follow the existing standards, if that's what you would like to do, but also provide that flexibility. So let's dig into the software and I will show you in a couple of examples. Flexible to be lean. To be lean, exactly, exactly. yeah. Okay, so on your screen, you can see LOD Planner. If I go into a project, you can see this would be the BIM execution plan, identifying BIM goals and BIM uses. We've got webinars on that, so we're not gonna go into the detail here. But we're going to move to the scope. So to show you the scope, to dig into those six aspects. So the first one was elements. If we follow a standard having a fixed set of elements, it is a challenge. We were asked to be able to turn things on and off. So simply being able to say, if we do not want something, I can uncheck it. And then when I uncheck it, it disappears from our visual representation of what we are, what we're scoping. I like to start with the purpose. The purpose is going to give you the reasons why you need these elements in the first place. Right. So as a system in general, and as a whole, you might want to cut out some of the waste and be lean by, by taking out some of those elements you don't need for this particular. Yeah, what's important for your BIM use. As we saw in that first page in the plan, it's defining BIM uses. And then when you move into the, the scoping, we can define either the BIM use as a column, as a deliverable, as a stage or as a data drop, or we can define it as a package so that we can define exactly what the BIM use and the set of scope is that's required for that. Purpose, as Louis says, what is the purpose of defining this scope? And then being able to set the elements and then being able to define the geometry. So one of the interesting things here was if we wanted to increase the geometry, we could. So just by raising that geometry level, we could simply show that. And if we did or did not want the reinforcement, we can choose to turn it off, right. turn it on. You can see that Some showing standard, it. Because you're increasing the, the geometry, you have to increase uh, some of these elements, rebar. For, right, for do we want to model rebar, right. yes or no? It, it can be very easy to falsely specify something that maybe nobody's even going to use. So that flexibility was key there. Right. And what you'll notice is when we deviate from the standard, 
it becomes a special use case. It's not specifically that the LOD number that was fixed with all of those different aspects before. The maturity, the reliability, so coupled with the concept of being able to understand what is going to be modeled at what geometry, what detail, but also what is that reliability? And that was a combined effect. And that was the conundrum as the, the definition of LOD went from level of detail to level of development. It, we're trying to do both of those things, splitting them out so that we could choose, is this just proposed? Right. Is it coordinated? Is it as built? If we move all the way to that scale of as built, we can then also introduce this concept of accuracy. So what's the purpose or the elements? What is the geometry, geometric detail? And then if we're going to choose to model something as an as-built, how accurate do we need that to be? Do we want to measure with a tape measure and then represent that in the model and understand that the accuracy is going to be less? Or would we like to have a laser scan of that and be able to go through that work? The last one was the information. Being able to choose in a targeted way the exact information requirement. Instead of having to choose a, a scale, a level, and then include 40 different parameters that were not required by people, it was how can we use one? And if we just want, for example, warranty information, then we can search for warranty. We can pick from anything that's a standard or something maybe from the, the IFC set of parameters. And we can choose to include one or more of these and then add it to the specific elements that we need it for. Rather than specifying across the board and, and much more wasteful sets of, of requirements. Yeah, we've seen a, one standard specify over 50 information requirements. And you, maybe you just need two of those. For right. Me. It can be very... Yeah time consuming <laughs> we, we've been on projects ourselves where there has been a requirement for a lot of information that we know has not been used and, and so it can be frustrating and it can be a significant risk as well so what we're trying to share there was how you can follow a number if that's exactly how you need it but then the added flexibility to make those adjustments to remove an element or to really carry on with what what is practical for the project right then, then we talked about 500. We, we, we actually about talked this about this one already. Yep. Um, so we're running out of time. Louis is like, quick, we're running out of time. <laughs> so being able to, when you hit that point of after construction and you would like an as-built, how accurate would you like your as-built? And being able to team up with the level of accuracy specification with the USIBD, being able to apply that is really, really fundamental now in specifying your as-built. This, this is one I kind of like to talk about. Yeah. It's, um, you know, how do we avoid that miscommunication up front and then do avoid signing ourselves up for projects that we can't commit to or, or complete? We wanted a way to engage with owners, keep it open in one area, one platform, go down certain checklists, but also have a, a, a form of a way that you can push LOD, the number aside and give them a specific definition. What we saw as being important was being, being able to just use plain language. So instead of using a number, if we turn the text on, you can see that that shows now the specific geometric representation and how mature, how reliable that is required to be. So this was the example we just changed, wanting fabrication level and as built. And that would flag up and I would say, hold on one second, <laughs> this is probably too much. So we would be able to have a conversation around it. The, the next challenge was the disconnect between the specs and the spreadsheets. Um, usually you might need two, two monitors, as that quote said. Right. Uh, sometimes you have this stack and you have to keep going back and forth. But what we really wanted to do is make this visual. And this is why those images are integrated and they really show you what you're specifying and not not just that one image that's fixed. That, that engagement, again, with the clients has just been key to go down this list and see the important elements and then add those information to, to each of those elements. This makes BIM planning a little bit fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you say an image is a thousand words. It's worth a thousand words. Well, this is thousands of images and they're all flexible. You can see being able to turn them on and off. And I'm just going to quickly show that as well, as well because that's pretty powerful showing the element level we can actually turn these on and off 
by clicking on them. You can see if I zoom in, you can see these have now disappeared. I can add them back and you can see that coming into the, the application. It's a really powerful, really flexible, very visual, very easy to be able to do that. What we've gone through today is six different ways that we've seen challenges and they've been brought up by people that have been doing this for many years. And we've been really pleased to be able to work with those teams to be able to understand and then present solutions, what we thought were solutions, and then get told that they were completely wrong and then try and make them more simple and more powerful at the same time, more flexible. And what we were able to do was solve those and more. And now we've been able to provide also the free accounts. So if you're interested, please the button on the top of the website and register your free account if you're not on the platform already.